Hello, everybody, and happy, happy hour. It's Wednesday, it's hum day, it's happy hour, and it is time for our regular installment of happy hour where we uh, meet with awesome women from all over the automotive industry. And this week, I am super excited to have Alana Schur join us. Uh, we'll hopefully see her raise her hand to join in here in just a few moments. Um, she is an incredible woman. If you don't know her, she is an automotive journalist. She is a author. She's a turner of wrenches she's a youtuber she is a lover and driver of classic cars uh, she occasionally appears on roadkill um, she's witty she's smart um, and she's passionate about what she does and here's an important thing on top of all of that is she's a professional interviewer guys which means that she does this for a living. She interviews people professionally and I'm going to be interviewing an interviewer. So this is gonna be a little different for me. Um, it looks like she has just requested to join. So let's see if we can add her in. Gotta love technology. We'll have her joining us in just a little bit. Hopefully she'll be easy on me. Anyway, hi. That's all right. I heard hi, cheers. I to hear you say nice things, so thank you. Yes, absolutely. Always nice things about you, my dear. Always. <laughs> so I'm super excited to have you on here. Anybody who's joining in uh, who doesn't know Alana, make sure you give her page a follow and check out all of the amazing work that she does. Um, she's really quite a witty writer and her articles and blogs and videos are, are very entertaining and fun and educational and all of that good stuff. So make sure you tune in. So I'm excited about today. Me too, and you look really cute. Aw, thanks. That may last for like five minutes. I have to turn the air conditioning off in my house when I do these lives because it's so loud. So by the <laughs> end of happy hour, I'm like, <laughs> Well, I, I apologize in advance for airplanes, dogs, trains. Oh no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have the worst house in the world for recording anything. But you have the most amazing dogs. They're so big guys. That's okay. <laughs> so I want to start with introducing you to everybody who doesn't know who you are. Um, I, I read your introduction that you did of yourself in Car and Driver um, recently, and I loved a quote that you had where you were, how did you say, you, you were looking for a job where you could celebrate people's engineering skills and get paid to do things like sleep on the, a Viper wing. And it turns out there is one. Um, so I love that. So tell me how, take us back a little bit, like you did in that article, to how did you end up where, where you are? How did you get your start in automotive? Gosh, it's, it's so funny, right? Like every time that I talk, especially to women, but really to anybody about like how they ended up in automotive, um, especially these kind of side automotive jobs like automotive jour journalism storytelling hosting there's always like a really long process um, <laughs> and there or at least there was for me uh i you yeah. know i went to school for art um i wasn't even going to school for writing i, I wanted oh. to be a visual artist i went for photography and painting oh, and sculpture classes and because i worked for a sculptor i learned mold making hmm. and after i was done with school I got a job working, uh, making carbon fiber for motorcycle bo body. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's awesome. <laughs> it was a long time ago. And uh, at the same time, I had bought a 73 Plymouth Duster just because I needed a car. I didn't even have a driver's license until I was 21. And then I needed a car. And my closest friend was into Chrysler's. And so he's like, well, I'll help you. Let's go test drive cars. Because I couldn't even go test drive a car because I didn't have a driver's license. It's like, um. I just did everything backwards. But so I had the 73 Duster, which of course then needed to be repaired because, I mean, it was a good car, but even so things broke. And so started learning how to fix it. And I liked that. And then I started going to some car shows, Bob Big, Bob's Big Boy, that kind of thing. And I liked those people and I liked the other cars and they were always talking about car magazines. So I started reading car magazines and like didn't understand anything, you know, like <laughs> nothing. I so relate to that. I so relate like, to that. Okay, I know the word blue. <laughs> um, but then I just kind of kept leaping through them like a little kid looking at pictures and then associating what I was seeing in the magazines with what people were talking about at the car shows. 
And it was like maybe after a year or something, I was reading one and I was like, wait, I understood most of that. When did that even happen? I don't even remember learning that. And I think that's, that's something that can happen when you're really excited about something. It's like all of a sudden you learn about it. You didn't even, you didn't even try yeah. to. Yeah. Um, so that gets us up to me not being completely ignorant of cars and actually having a driver's license. And also I really liked the magazines. I was like, man, that seems, that seems fun. Like whatever these guys are doing, I wonder yeah. if there's a way I could do that. And I started applying to car magazines and I applied to car magazines for 10 years oh, wow. before David Freiberger gave me a job at Hot Rod. Um, ah. so that's a lot of years of like a few rejections, but mostly just totally being ignored, you know, like just, I wouldn't even get like a email back. It would just be like, yeah, no. Is that kind of the norm? Um, I would say it's. Uh oh, you're anyone. freezing up a little bit. <laughs> it's probably the norm for anyone. I mean, it's a, it's the kind of job where a lot of people want to do it and there aren't very many positions for it. So open spots don't show up very often. But I also think that there were, there were a few people who weren't interested in me just because they didn't figure I would know what I was talking about to do it. Um, because... <laughs> Because you're a um, girl? Yeah, because I wasn't a <laughs> dude. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I saw people get jobs who knew less than I did. And I was like, I also applied for that job. And I don't think I'm a jerk. And I know my clips were good. So, yeah. but, um, but that wasn't the case with Freiburger. And it wasn't the case with Hot Rod. And uh, yeah, and how long? amazing. How long ago was that? Um, 2012, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you were going after it for a while before you had your breakthrough. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had a job working in PR after the motorcycle stuff. And that was really interesting. And I have so much respect for people who do good work in PR and marketing, because it is a very difficult job, especially if you work in an agency, yeah. where you're kind of being bounced all over the place, having to be an expert in a lot of different things. But yeah. so I learned a lot there. I learned a lot of problem solving there, which I think has been helpful in what I've done since then. But I really wanted to be on the other side of it. And, and I'm glad to be there now. Yeah. So what have you done since then? Tell everybody a little bit about what you're doing and how you landed your current most awesome gig that you've got going. <laughs> okay, I'll do this one fast. Um, okay, no, that's so, okay. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. So is that Hot Rod for three years, I think. And when I was at Hot Rod, it was right at the time that um, Freiburger and Finnegan were starting Roadkill. So okay. I was I was part of some of the early planning on Roadkill, as were some of the other Hot Rod people. And, um, and then Roadkill started taking off so much that Freiburger moved from being editor in chief of, of Hot Rod to just doing Roadkill. Right. And then a few years after that, one or two after that, he he couldn't even run all of Roadkill by himself because Roadkill was so big. And so that was when he asked me if I would be interested in coming over to the Roadkill side from, from Hot Rod and kind of not being on the show, but running everything else. So the building the social media, uh, doing the, at the time they wanted to do a print magazine and a website, and they were doing all these events. And they basically just needed somebody who wasn't necessarily worried about being on camera to actually interact with the Roadkill fans and, and help tell their stories and stuff. So. Um, so I did that for two or three years. Um, okay. And uh, it all blurs together. Um, right. <laughs> I think it was probably two years at Roadkill. Um, cause, yeah, it was like eight magazines. Um, and uh, it was super fun. I loved it. It was amazing. Um, it was really fun to get to kind of be a, a boss because, you know, I had an editor-in-chief title, even if I didn't have a staff. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You were a boss of one. You were a yeah, boss of yourself. Yeah, yes. my own boss, <laughs> which is really the best kind of boss. And, um, you know, and then the company went in a different direction, you know, with the magazine and I and with the website. And I didn't really want to stay on as kind of like a floating, like a floating character there. I, so I wanted to keep writing and I wanted to tell stories. So um, 
so that was when I left and went freelance. And the first year of freelance, honestly, is kind of a blur. It was it was pretty miserable. I was like, well, I was sad about the magazine. I mean, it wasn't anybody's fault over there. You know, magazines come and go all the time. You definitely have to have a thick skin if you want to be in media these days. It's not it's not the kind of career where you get to stay at one place for for decades and um but it was sort of my first time leaving a job not under my own terms and not because I wanted to and so I was I was sad about it and I was worried about what I was going to do in the future and you know freelance is a very different it's a very different way of organizing yourself um wow. People who like it, like it because you're, you truly are your own boss. There's nobody to make you do the work. But the problem right. is that- There's nobody to make, nobody you, do to make you do the work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so that, yeah, that first year is kind of a blur. And I was very lucky because a friend of mine, Abby, Abby Bassett, who's also a, a journalist, was working at a place called Edmonds at the time and they needed a, um, they needed a host for their video reviews and they were specifically looking for a woman to bring onto the team because their, their review team for video was all men. And Abby was like, why don't you apply for this? Why don't you do a screen test? And I was like, I don't know how to do video. Like I'm a writer. And, uh, and she's like, well, just do a screen test, you know? And um, can I swear on this? Yeah, totally. Do you, boo. You do um, you. <laughs> so I did the screen test and it was like, um, they had us, drive a, a Toyota Prius and you know at the time I'm coming from hot rodding I like I li literally <laughs> had not been in very many new cars at all that weren't maybe <laughs> the new Corvette the new Mustang and the new Challenger and I certainly hadn't been in a new Prius and so right. you know we're in it and the like producer is sort of in the back seat asking me questions I'm driving and talking and the camera's on me and he's um and he says uh you know can you tell me how regenerative braking works and I said fuck <laughs> it I know <laughs> And I was like, oh, well, that's the end of that one. <laughs> not going to get a call. And um, and they called me like a couple weeks later and they were like, you know, we just really liked your test. It was funny. You had a lot of personality. Maybe you should learn how regenerative <laughs> breaking works. But um, you want to give this a try. And <laughs> Do you know now? Do you know now how a regenerative breaking works? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Um, but that really saved me because it was so stressful trying to do all this like piecemeal freelance work and worrying about bringing in enough money to pay my bills and stuff. Because when you're first going freelance, it's like you're doing stuff for like a hundred bucks a pop, two hundred bucks a pop, and yeah, it's not grown up money. Um, and so because no. Edmonds gave me some regular work, I was able to kind of relax a little bit and do what I feel was hopefully a better job on on the other stuff that I was doing because I wasn't worried quite so much about making all of my money off of it and right you know so then yeah. with freelance if you do a good job if you hit the deadlines and you do a good job then people will ask you to do more work um and that's what's happened with me so I've been I've been very busy and still doing stuff for Edmonds and then this year I've started doing stuff for Car and Driver which is really really exciting and you just wrote a book. That's right. You've oh been God, like crazy busy. You've been insanely busy. I love it. I, I want people to hear though, it's really important. I think that like, cause we can, it's easy to look at you now, right? And be like, oh, she's got all of these gigs. She's doing all of this stuff. She's living the life. Your oh, cat is introducing himself. Really, really <laughs> handsome. <laughs> He's gonna stick his butt in the camera. <laughs> ratings. So that's how you get ratings. Right? Apparently. Apparently. Um, I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> um, you know, it's really easy to look at where where you're at, right? And think that that happened overnight, right? And and yet you've been working your butt off for so long. Seriously, cat. Oh my god. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, I don't know. He sleeps all day all day and the minute i go online he's like oh hey camera oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah i think it's really good for people to hear to hear this that yeah you're super busy now and yeah you're super successful now but it didn't it didn't start that way right 
Yeah, and I, I mean, yeah, I hope that helps somebody else out. And and also in talking to other people who are, you know, successful people that I was looking up to during the times when I was freaking out, I mean, they are constantly kind of hustling at it too. I mean, I, I don't know how you feel, but um, it, most of the people that I talk to who are successful would never say, yeah, I'm sitting back now. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, right. And I think that's probably what yeah. makes them successful. Uh, if you can manage to do that without letting it eat you up too much, because then it's like, what's the point of living if you're just constantly freaking out about work? But when you mentioned totally. the book, and, and I wrote a book with Don Prudhomme, the, the drag racer, the snake, and there's a section in it that's stuck with me. He, I mean, he said a lot of really interesting stuff because he very much was a self-made man. And, um, and he, at one point I was like, well, how did you know when you made it? You know, how did you know, like, oh, all right, this is cool. Like I'm rich and successful and I don't need, and he was like, I don't even feel like that today. I was like, dude, you're 80. Like, how do you not, <laughs> you don't feel like you've made it? He's right. Like, he's like, well, you know, he's like, I'm proud of the stuff that I've done, but I would. Yeah. Yeah. No. No, I think it's encouraging. I think it's really valuable. I, I, a, a woman who was involved in the all female build um, shared a story with me similarly that she got to have a conversation with Chip Foose at one point earlier in career, and she asked him, "What? Um, when? When did you feel like you you knew what you were doing?" Right. When did you get to that point where you felt like you knew what you were doing? And he was like, I still don't. <laughs> right? Like, I'm still learning. I'm still figuring it out. And I thought that was a really powerful thing, because I think we all look at people from the outside and go, oh, my God. You, you've got it all figured out and we don't. Right. But what it looks like on the inside versus the outside is a different story. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, especially when you start adding in social media now, which I think that is something that you know, not just the kids, but as adults too, have to, to think about because most people aren't posting their big fails or their boring days or the day where the days where they're just like not getting anything done. They're posting, right. You know, the trip that they went on where they got, you know, they're posting a picture of them successfully putting the engine in. Right. And, you know, they're not posting the, right. uh, after, after a bunch of tries that didn't work. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I always like that you post <laughs> stuff about fails. I think that's so helpful, um, especially trying to encourage people to do physical stuff is, I mean, you have to learn how to do it. And even when you do know how to do it, you're going to get caught off guard sometimes. Sometimes things don't work. Sometimes the part is bad and it breaks. And you have to figure yeah. out what to do next. Yeah. And sometimes you're tired and sometimes you miss something and sometimes you're looking at it too closely and you have blinders on and it takes walking away to go, oh, <laughs> right? Like, how did I miss that? So yeah, absolutely. I think we all kind of have those moments and yet we don't publish those. We don't share those. And so it's easy for young folks to, to look at us and go, oh, they have it all together. They're perfect. Why am I such a failure? And like, <laughs> no, no, we're all, <laughs> we're all in that same boat, really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think that, um, I mean, it's not that I want to change the word fail, because it, it is what it is. It, it's something that wasn't a success. But I definitely would encourage people to, you know, to think of their failures, not as the end of something, but just as the beginning of the next step of it. Um, they're not so yeah. bad. Yeah, it was a failure at doing what you tried to do. But it's a success at learning something new. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there are a couple of failures that you should try to avoid. Um, I would say any sort of hoist or jack stand failure that can yes. end things. But for the most part, you can recover from, from almost anything. Yes, there's definitely, I mean, we all try to avoid failure, right? But the reality is, is that, is that they're reality <laughs> and it's part of life and it's part of learning. It's part of growing. And 
I wish we all shared them more often and shared just our realness with, with people more often. So I, I applaud, I, I really appreciate that about your writing style actually, <clears throat> is that you're really um, personable and real. And it feels like when, when I'm reading your work, when I'm reading your articles, it, it feels like you're just talking to me. And I really appreciate that. It's not like highfalutin and difficult to understand. It's not, it's attainable, right? And I think that's a really important thing is if you're telling people stories, you, you want it to be attainable and reachable and, and, you know, feel intimate. So I think that's a pretty awesome, awesome thing that you've managed to do in your writing. Well, well thank you. I, I feel like um, all of the various mentors I've had in my life would be pleased to hear that. Um, I mean, I did, you know, I, I did get good advice from another writer when I was starting out about getting started, which was, all right, something happened, an, an action happened, and you want to tell your friend about it. So how would you tell your friend about it? Um, and obviously, sometimes you need to put more information in because maybe your friend would already know some of it. But, but that kind of idea is, sure. you know, is part of, of a lot of different writing practices. And um, and it wasn't a part of automotive writing for a long time, um, which I think is sort of maybe what makes, there's like a few automotive writers who are very famous. And I think that what makes them famous above the others is that they were kind of people who pushed the, the style of writing to be more personable, to be more conversational, um, when before it was always maybe more technical or more, um, I don't know what the right word is exactly, but like, I don't, I don't like reading things where I feel talked down to. Um, yeah. And I don't like reading something where, even if I do understand it, I don't like reading something where I can tell that the writer is trying to make, trying to make their readers feel a little bit dumb or trying to show how much they, the writer they know. know. Yeah. Uh, and so, if anything, I, I feel like when I write stuff, I'll usually go back through and try and make sure that that I simplify things that that are too complicated um, so that it doesn't come across that way. And usually I end up finding Yeah. Yeah. You're freezing up a little bit. I don't know if everybody else is seeing this. I'm frozen. Oh no. I'm back. Okay. Beautiful. Sorry guys for, for technical difficulties. Gotta love technology. Oh, she's freezing up again. Oh, there you are. You're back. Do we have you with us? <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> I, I see you more, right? I see you more clearly now. So that's beautiful. That's a good thing. All right. We'll hope it stays that way. No, I, I totally agree with you. And it's funny as I'm listening to you, like it, it just reminds me back of the beginning of your story when you said you were, you know, starting to read these car magazines and feeling like, oh my gosh, I don't. Don't move. <laughs> uh oh. We're going to better better Wi Fi maybe. Still frozen. No, you're. T it's worse. You're totally frozen now. Oh, wait. Darn. Nope. Now we're good. Now we're good. I think. Okay. Now you're frozen again. Ah, okay, hold on. <laughs> Give me a second. Oh no. Okay. Try. Okay. It is like more. fixing the TV antennas. <laughs> Let's see about. 
How about over here? Is this better or worse? Uh, I think it's better. Okay. I think we'll so. Try, we'll try this then. All right. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. This is the, the challenge of technology. It's awesome and it's awful all at the same time. I can, <laughs> can change the brake booster in a car and build an engine, but I can't figure out how to make my phone work. Oh, I feel you. I'm horrible with computers like laptops and PCs and that kind of stuff, but cars I got. It's like the other computers, I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> but this is much better. I can see you clearly now. Oh, good. Uh, you can I, also see some potting mix behind me. Beautiful. Beautiful. She gardens too. <laughs> we're, uh, we're redoing our backyard, so. Nice. I'm excited about that. That's exciting. Is, are, are the dogs just going to tear it back up again? Um, most of it's going to be wood. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Good. Very cool. <laughs> All right. All right. Where were we? Where, where were we? Being accessible and how it like your story of kind of how and why you want your articles to be approachable. It, it just reminds me of when you when you first got into reading car magazines. And for me, it was the same thing when I, that's kind of what got me into cars was starting to read car magazines and not getting it, not understanding it and wanting to read more, but really also feeling like it was, there was a barrier of entry there because I felt like all of the articles that I was reading were like, no, no, stay away. If you don't know enough to read this article, then you don't deserve to be reading this article. And so I think it's really cool that you've kind of taken that full circle and made that kind of your, your point now and how you write is to not be that and to be more accessible. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the term that people in all different kinds of groups, science and gaming and cartoons and cars use is, is gatekeeping. Um, that there's gatekeepers who kind of make it easier or harder for people to enter the hobby. And yeah. I, I don't think that the car hobby needs to be protected from having more people in it. You know, we're not, if anything, we need as many. We need more. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, so why would I make it worse for somebody, you know, like, why would I make somebody feel bad about wanting to be a part of it and not knowing how? Um, yeah. You know, it's, uh, awesome. I, I once went to a, an amateur astronomy meeting. This is, okay. my dad's a, optical engineer but nice. so I went to this amateur astronomy meeting and it was like a big meeting all full of people and there were these two old guys up at the front and they were talking about telescopes and one of them said you know I don't want you to ever feel ashamed to ask me how something works if we're if we're out at a star viewing party or whatever because because there was a time when I didn't know how it worked I wasn't born knowing how it worked and someone showed me how it worked and so amen I I want to be a person who shows other people how it works. And then there's going to be stuff I still don't know. And so maybe we can learn it together. Yeah. Cheers to that. That's absolutely. I, I, I always get so irritated. I see that a lot in the automotive industry. It's this idea like, well, I worked hard to learn my lessons. I'm not just going to share them with just anybody. And it's like, wow, you didn't, you didn't come out of the womb knowing everything. Let's not bash people who are just starting out. We should be encouraging the hobby and encouraging the curiosity. It, I, this was actually a question that I wanted to ask you, and so it transitions nicely, um, and I'm curious if, if this is your answer. You come to the industry from a different perspective than I do. Uh, what do you, do you feel like is the biggest challenge facing our industry right now? And is it that? Is it attracting people? Well, or is it something I, else? I mean, you, you mean like aside from the whole coronavirus thing? <laughs> aside from that. Yeah, because currently I would say that that's a that's a challenge none of us were expecting. Um, totally. But I would say that you know, back in the olden days before coronavirus, yeah, I think that attracting new people and also like recovering a reputation. It's funny because I was just listening to. Uh, do you know Brian Loans? You know Brian, right? You know, yeah, not NHRA, well, but yeah. NHRA, NHRA, NHRA announcer. But he has a great podcast that's all about automotive history called Dorkomotive. And so I was listening to a recent one where that was all about the NHRA and Wally Parks and the beginning of drag racing as an organized sport. And uh, it was a real challenge for, for Wally Parks because in the 40s, drag racing was truly hoodlum stuff. Like, 
you know, it was really looked down upon. And um, there were a lot of arguments against making places for people to go race, because mm -hmm. there were people who just thought everyone who was doing it should be in jail. So um, I think that in some ways, the automotive hobby is facing that again, not literally, not in that they think that we're hoodlums, but that it has a bad rep. It, it's got a reputation for being people who don't care about the environment, for people who are slow to make social changes, for people who are, you know, sexist and racist. And that it's not, that's not true. I mean, you know, it's not true. And I know it's not true. And, um, and so I think that as a whole, we not only need to attract people in, but we need to figure out how we can address non-car people's very legitimate concerns about car culture without admitting that it's bad because it isn't bad, but there right. are things that we should think about as a, you know, as a group. I think that's really well said because it, it is, I, I find myself torn often because there are those elements of the industry and folks just like any industry, right? There, there are elements that, that maybe could be looked at a little bit and maybe there's time for some and room for some change and some progress and some growth. Um, and, and yet overall, the people who I've met being in the automotive industry and I've gotten to know are some amazingly wonderful human beings. I know a ton of amazing people who are in various areas of this industry and yet it's the old stereotypes. It's the old reputations about the industry. And a lot of it is, you know, kind of like anything else, a few bad seeds make the name for, for the entire industry. And I think that's a, a reputation that we have to, that we're fighting to attract yeah. people in. I agree. I mean, I think overall, I would say the majority of people that I've ever met in the industry have been pretty great. And, um, you know, it's just, it's always unfortunate that, that the minority can be so loud, but, um, <laughs> yes, true. You know, I think that, I think that we have, we have a good thing to offer people. And I, and I think that um, there's going to be a real need for people who can fix things again in the future. You know, like just looking at what's happening this year when, you know, when we're, we're all sort of stuck at home and it's like, well, what could you be doing right now? Well, if you had a project car, you could really be right. entertaining yourself. You know? <laughs> I mean, Tom and I haven't been bored one day of the shutdown. It's been great. We're getting stuff fixed. The truck's getting fixed. The Trans Am's right? getting fixed. The Polara's getting fixed. Everything's going to be running by the time we're ready to go again. I love it. I wish I could say the same thing about me. My goodness. My graveyard of cars is still a graveyard of cars. One day. One day. <laughs> we have um, real work. I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody wants to know if you have a YouTube channel. I do. I do have a YouTube channel. It's the same How as all my social it? accounts. It's called Challenge Her. And it's me and Tom. And, um, you know, keep your expectations low. We're, uh, we're way too lazy to do any sort of real video work. So it's like one takes in the garage and driving some you know, driving some cars around, but nothing, uh, nothing elaborate. I love it, though. I love it. It's uh, in, in alignment with you and your, your persona, very real and very <laughs> transparent. And so I love that about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, um, there's sometimes Tom and I joke about stuff because like, we'll be working in the garage. And then I'll be like, Oh, can you take a picture of me? And he's like, Oh, you want you want to convince your people you did some work? And I'm like, yeah, I do. You know, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, but it's like, you know, I try to not ever, I try to not ever say that I'm doing something that I'm not doing. And, sure. you know, and I try to do enough things that what I that I can tell the truth, and it's interesting, and hopefully, managing yeah. that. No, I think you're doing a fantastic job at that. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I feel your pain because I'm like, we always, we always forget to take pictures of ourselves when we're working because we're, you know, working, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, people are always asking me, post more pictures of you working. I'm like, I, I don't take pictures of myself when I'm working because I'm, my hands are busy with tools and wrenches and things. <laughs> oh, question for you on that one. Yeah. Uh, how long ago was it that you realized that you could take a picture of yourself sort of doing the work after you've already done it and then you will look pretty like all of the other people who take pictures of themselves working because i used to like 
like if it was like a picture of me twerking something, I'd be like twerking it. And I'm like, why do I look like such a monster all the time? And everyone else looks pretty while they're working. And then finally, a friend of mine who, who also does car stuff was like, well, you twerk it first and then you take a picture of yourself. So I didn't figure that out until you just said that, actually. Yeah. I, I just know, learned right? that right now. Like, thank you. Thank you for that gift. Because <laughs> yeah, I am that nobody, idiot. Nobody looks pretty twerking. It's only Oh, my God. Twerking. I am totally that idiot all the time. And my, my producer on All Girls Garage, actually, I mean, like a couple of times he would say to me, like, can you not make that face? And I'm like, that's, that's, just, like, that's just my face. <laughs> I can't <laughs> help it. <laughs> it's a stronging face, you know, like it, my muscles don't work if I'm not making that face. <laughs> exactly. Like, I don't know how to be cute while doing that. Sorry. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Well, and, th and that is, you know, we were talking about sort of reality and Instagram and all of those things. And, uh, you know, people just assume that, that you already know that. And like, I'll talk to I'll talk to friends, you know, friends I consider to be, you know, cuties, Instagram cuties. And they'll mm -hmm. be like, oh, yeah, there are filters for that. Or, yeah, you can, you just do the work and then you take a picture. And I'm like, you can do that? That's not cheating? They're like, that's not cheating. That's fine. And I was like, oh, so you don't look exactly like that? And they're like, no, I have a big zit. And like, oh, my God, really that's so funny. It's just a filter. <laughs> like, Magic. The other one that I was taught um, by some of the ladies out on the builds is you set up your camera to take video while you're working, and then you just scrub through it to find a still frame within that where you don't <laughs> look like you have three heads or you're making a weird, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so there's, there's another trick. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've given up on all of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I just assumed you were already doing it because you always look cute in your pictures, so. Aww. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> oh, man. Um, gotta um, love it. Well, on set, I get lots of good photographs while I'm on set because we have a makeup artist who's there to make us pretty. And the lighting is perfect and all of the things, right? But in my real life, mm-mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, so I want to talk about your, your current gig a little bit with Car and Driver. So you're doing yep. a regular, you're doing a regular column with them now, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Is that like every week? Is that every month? It's every month. And so, um, I mean, you know, I don't know about you guys out there watching, but I mean, I did, you know, was reading magazines. I, I mean, I grew up reading magazines, not car magazines, but, um, and, and columnists was always like the coolest gig. Um, yeah. It, because it was like, again, like you got just to feel like somebody was talking to you and every month was like a different, different concept. And, um, and you kind of get to know the, the person and they have interaction with the readers. Um, and when I was at Hot Rod, I had a little column in the back, which was really fun. Uh, I, it was actually a very good challenge. And if anybody's out there trying to think about writing, I do recommend this. Give yourself a very short word count. It was like a 300 word column. Ooh. And uh, and see what kind of stories you can tell with 300 words. And it's really, I mean, it makes you get to the point and it makes you really look at your jokes and say, like, is this a really funny joke? Because if I put this joke in, I can't put that joke in and that kind of stuff. So that was really fun. I had that, that column. And then for a while I had, when I went freelance, I had a column at um, American Car Collector, which is a, an auction magazine, that uh, same company that does sports car market. Okay. And that was specifically about old car stuff. Um, and that was a much longer column. It was about a thousand words. Um, and then, you know, car and driver columnist. I mean, the, some of the most famous automotive journalists in the world were car and driver columnists, you know, Brock Yates, David E. Davis, uh, you know, Aaron Robinson, um, Ellen Dyer. Alana <laughs> Cher, right? I even get like the little picture, like the little drawing of myself. And, um, and so being asked to do it, like really blew my mind. And it was right at the beginning of the shutdown. Like truly I got the call um, basically on my very last press trip before oh everything gosh. shut down. And so, so I've never <laughs> even met the team in person. Oh, wow. You know, like we've never even met. We just talked, yeah. you know, over the phone, but. Um, 
That's got to be trippy. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> I'm like, I hope they like me when they actually meet me. But um, <laughs> but it's been really fun. It's uh, I'm I feel like I'm still learning it. When I read them, I think I'm on my fourth one now, maybe or fifth. And so when I read them, I'm now when they're in print, I'm like, okay, I need to like. They're not perfect at this. So it's about 750 words, which is in between the two that I've been doing before. And it's, it's every time that you take away or add words, it really changes how to structure it and what kind of research they do and stuff. But I, I am really excited and I hope that they like me enough to, to let me do it for a while. So, uh, you know, if you want to help out, resubscribe to Car and Driver or at least send a letter to Car and Driver saying that you're resubscribing because you're so excited about me as a columnist. <laughs> Everybody listening, did everybody get that? Write to Car and Driver and let them know how awesome she is. <laughs> you you made mention of the fact that there are now four women who are regularly contributing writers at Car and Driver. That's that's kind of a big deal, huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'd like to believe that um, that even if there had been men in charge at Car and Driver, they would have still considered hiring a woman columnist, but. Um, Sharon is the, the editor in chief. I believe she's the first woman editor in chief ever at Car and Driver. Um, and, uh, so she's editor in chief. Let's see. Um, any, I'm probably going to leave some women out. So, uh, I hope they don't get mad at me. Like I said, I've never even met the whole team, but Andy, <laughs> Andy White is a contributor there. Um, and, um, I believe they're, their test person now, like their, their numbers person, I think is now a woman as well, which is pretty nice. rad. Um, and then there's me and then there's a, you know, support staff, the copy, copy team and fact check team and, uh, and they're women, which is more common uh, for me at the magazines. I've always, there's always been women, but they've never been bylined. And so what I think is really cool about car and driver is that they, they have bylines and, and there are still a ton of men there. So it's like not a problem totally. guys. Like you can have yeah. more than more one woman and still have like plenty of room. A ton of men. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think it's really cool. I think it's going to be interesting to see over the next couple of, you know, decades, like how things change as we become more diverse of an industry, because I think it really just makes us, it makes us stronger and, um, and more robust and attract more people. And it's really exciting to see because I when when you and I were coming up like that, that wasn't a thing. Like, yeah, it's, I mean, it is, I think, I mean, it's terrifying to be like, oh gosh, I'm old enough to have seen change. But also it's really <laughs> cool because, I mean, honestly, when I started, even when I was in PR, but when I, you know, when I started, the magazine still had bikini girls on all the covers. Um, there were no women writing. Like the kind of, the way that people did write was always directed towards a male audience. So like any story you read would have like a, you know, like, well, your wife is going to like this or not like this or, you know, like that kind of thing where it's just like assuming that you're, you know, a straight dude who listens to Aerosmith or something like, right. based <laughs> on, you know, and. Um, right. And I don't know that it was necessarily intentional either. It was just that was the filter with which they saw the world because that's who they were, right? It's if yeah. you have all writers from the same demographic, then they're going to write to their own demographic unintentionally, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, we all do that and, and being able to write based off of your own experience is good because it gives you, you know, it gives you some, some flavor and, and some personality, but also being able to imagine that people might have a different take on it, I think is also good, you know, to be able to imagine that I know this is going to blow your mind, but there might be people who think that 800 horsepower is too much and is scary and unpleasant and irresponsible. And so <laughs> you don't have to agree with them. Right. But you should be aware that they might be reading it. If And therefore, is there a way that you can convince them that it that it isn't to those things or that that it might be OK if it is those things, um, you know, yeah. or uh, like to be able to. Uh, to think about people having different, you know, different kind of partners, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, so that you're not always assuming that everyone out there is, is a man married to a woman or, mm -hmm. um, you know, or that everybody out there is a man. 
period. Right. <laughs> yeah, or that everybody grew up with the same cultural reference points. So, like, mm -hmm. you know, it is funny when you look at the kind of music that people tend to, to use as examples in car magazines, and you're just like, that's a lot of classic rock. You know? Like, classic cars, classic rock. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so then it's always fun when you get uh, a writer who comes from a different, you know, like a different angle and maybe they compare it to something else, you know, like they make a hip hop reference or they make a Bollywood right. reference or something, you know, and you're just like, well, that's great. That's a metaphor I haven't heard before. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's awesome. I think, I think diversity in general is a fantastic thing because it's, it keeps it interesting, right? If we were all the same, God, how boring would life be? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even like, you know, I don't even like to have their mosquitoes here. I don't even like to have, like, more than one of the same, like, car, you know? I, I know there are some people who like to have, like, you know, 10 different Corvettes or whatever, but I, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I already have one of those. So, like, what? what I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that, but not intentionally. Not because I don't appreciate diversity of cars. I just have collected a lot of BMWs over the years, and none of them run, so. They do, I mean, <laughs> when you have ones that don't run, they attract more that don't run because you get project ones, and then people are also like, oh, you're running a rescue. Uh, I mean, people are always, always <laughs> Oh, I like that, open. I like that. It's not a yeah. graveyard, it's a rescue. Yeah, it's a rescue. <laughs> yeah. It's like a humane society for cars. For just five dollars a day, you can save this poor BMW. <laughs> exactly, exactly. In the arms of the angels. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm going to start an ad campaign to help me with my BMW rescue. Yeah. <laughs> As somebody just commented, must resist BMW joke. It's not because they're BMWs that they don't run, FYI. It's because I, um, it's the shoemaker's children. The shoemaker's children go without shoes, and so all of my cars are dead. Yeah. Don't judge me. Yeah. The mechanic, <laughs> the, the professional mechanic's personal fleet is, uh, is all in need of uh, assistance. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk content. You, yeah. You've interviewed some amazing people in your lifetime. Who has been your most, um, your favorite memorable that you've taken the most away from person that you've interviewed or most memorable? Um, besides you. <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> She's really uh, showering the compliments. I like this. <laughs> oh, it's just, it's so fun to talk to another person. I like nothing but positivity. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> that is a fascinating question. Um, I I think a lot about the interview that I did with Shirley Muldowney. Um, it wasn't a super long written interview. It was in Iron and Air a few years ago. I think it's online. Just because, you know, Shirley Muldowney, for those of you who don't know, was, uh, you know, basically the first very famous professional level woman uh, drag racer. And also, I believe, the first woman to win a championship in any sort of motorsports. Um, I'd have to check that. There are a lot of a lot of motorsports, but yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, so she started racing in the '60s, and uh, you know, really came to fame in the '70s and '80s. But uh, obviously, maybe not obviously, but obviously to me, she was a hero. She was a a role model, and I, when I started in the industry. I was kind of bummed and surprised to hear how many people sort of talk badly of her. Um, hmm. Not not about her success, but, you know, about her, you know, they say like, oh, well, she's bitter or she was mean or, you know, she's not a nice person. And, it, you know, so when I went to interview her, I was a little bit, scared I was like is she gonna be mean to me like you know what if I don't like her you know what if I don't yeah. like this person who I've based so what much of my life on yeah and uh, that wasn't the case at all you know and it made me realize something which I suspected already which is that it's very easy for people to look at someone who was a trailblazer later and 
list all their faults. Um, mm -hmm. But to actually be a trailblazer, it means you're cutting down branches all the time, right? You're going over obstacles all the time. To be able to do that and not have it affect you uh, emotionally and mentally, yeah. especially if you're doing it alone at the time, which she was. Totally. You know, yeah, it's going to make you touchy. It's going to make you overly sensitive. And I felt like it was a really good... It was really good for me to realize that for a couple of reasons. One is because now when I do catch myself moving towards a kind of oversensitivity or bitterness, I can say, you're not wrong for thinking this, but it's not going to do you good to hold it. Let it, you know, let it go. Like, you know, like she would say now that there are a lot of things she wished she had let go, um, but she didn't. And they, you know, and she deals with it now, you know, you make decisions and you, and you keep that with you. And, um, and also to, you know, to really have, have an escape and have a family that is important to you and, and healthy to you, I think is really important if you're trying to do something great. Um, yeah. because again, she, you know, I think she really regrets not, you know, some of the choices that she made regarding, you know, when she, when she was focused as a mother and when she was, um, focused as a racer and I don't know that she could have made those choices differently at the time you know it's not right. like drag racing was exactly you know Shocking. It, to look at <laughs> to look at people who did that and and have some have some sympathy and respect for what they went through you know it, it, similarly uh you know, I've, I've talked with Willie T. Ribs, and I don't know if you saw the Willie T. Ribs documentary that's been on Netflix. Uh, that okay. Adam Carolla did. It's called Uppity. Highly recommend. Very good. Okay. Will, Willie T. Ribs was the, uh, you know, the first black racer to uh, successfully qualify for the Indy 500, and he raced Trans Am. He was really quite successful. Um, and, you know, his video, his documentary is called Uppity because people say, well, he had a bad attitude, and he didn't you know, he didn't play the game and he was hard to sponsor and he, you know, and I've talked to him and he's like, if I played the game, they would have found some other reason to keep me out. You know, like sometimes you just have to be ferocious and, and because he was ferocious, we have people like Lewis Hamilton and Bubba Wallace who are able to be a little bit more nuanced in their, in their behavior. And because Shirley yeah. was ferocious, you and I are able to be here and not be constantly on guard and constantly defending against attacks. So yeah. uh, I really recommend that everybody, you know, say a little silent thank you to, to the people that came before us because they really had a harder time than we did. And, and we wouldn't be here without them. Totally. I got amen and cheers to that 100%. Um, and I, and I think that's kind of what like motivates me now, right? Is if I, there were the trailblazers before me that made my life possible, right? I couldn't, I couldn't have even taken auto shop in high school if there weren't people before me who made that possible. I was only the second woman in my high school to take auto shop, right? Um, and, and in my mom's generation, that wasn't even an option, right? And so, how can we then make it easier for the next generation? And what can we do to contribute and, and give back? And I, um, I think so much of that is, is by just rocking it in our respective arenas and being visible, right? And I think it's really, it's really cool to start seeing so many women excelling in so many different areas and showing that you and I talked about this actually just the other day via, via text message about like, there's so many different ways to be a car person Right. And there are so many ways to be involved in this industry and there's so many opportunities. And it's so cool seeing so many more women doing this and so much more diversity in general, not just women. Like you talked about, about Wallace and and there's lots of other types of diversity, too. Right. <laughs> and so it's cool to see that change starting to happen and know that it does. It does kind of happen generationally. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, and I. Man, I can't wait. I can't wait. Like, I can't. I can't wait to be like an old lady and like, you know, just like watching whatever motorsports becomes and just seeing all these different faces out there and, and being totally. able to tell people, you know, when, 
Like, when I was a kid, you know, you could, right. you could watch a NASCAR race that was 30, 32 white guys in the cars. And they'd be like, no right. way, mom. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> I love, I love that, like, when I tell a 50-year-old a that I'm an auto mechanic, they're like, let me see your hands. I want to see proof, right? But when I tell a, a six-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 14-year-old that I'm a mechanic, they're like, okay. <laughs> right? Like, it just doesn't phase yeah. them. It's no big deal. And so it's really going to be exciting to see this next generation and, and how, how the world looks at that point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. I know it, it'll it'll be good and hopefully vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because as much as I love this technology and FaceTiming and talking and, and all of that good stuff, like it's really I miss I miss going out to dinner <laughs> with yeah, my people, right? right? <laughs> I was just like making a little list for myself while I was driving earlier today, of, like things that I miss and you know, like, like some of them are kind of random, like, uh, like I miss being at a dinner with somebody where you like pass, like you try somebody else's food. Like, <laughs> oh, do you want to try a bite? Like, does yes. that seem like disgusting right now? Like you can't even- I don't know, I'm, I'm a New York Jew. I mean, that's what we did, <laughs> right? But <laughs> well, I'm like, I love it normally. And like, now it's like, well, you gotta, you know, and like, so I'm like excited about dinners again and then I was thinking about karaoke and how fun karaoke is and how like oh man when are we gonna get to karaoke again it seems like a big old germ pile Ugh, soon hopefully speaking of soon though I just realized what time it is we only have three minutes left before Instagram <laughs> kicks us off and I have so many more questions I want to ask you which means we're gonna have to do this again at some point I would love that <laughs> we like didn't even scratch the surface I feel like <laughs> Well, I, I mean, we did spend like 10 minutes with my bad internet, so I apologize for that. No, no, no. That's okay. It happens. It's technology, man. But I want to thank you so, so very much for joining me and sharing all of your kernels of wisdom and experiences and your way with words. And I just, I truly enjoy talking to you. I appreciate you saying yes and hanging out with me for a little while. And um, I appreciate everybody who tuned in. Thank you guys all Thank for guys. coming and saying hello. And please make sure you go check her out and follow her page if you don't already. Give her some love. Read her articles in Car and Driver. And, uh, and tune in next week for another amazing guest. And I'll be sending you one of these as a, um, as a thank you for joining me for happy hour. And hopefully one day we'll get to actually like toast in, in real life soon yeah well thank you for having me and thanks for doing what you do and and speaking up for everybody i think it's great and you should be proud of yourself and you have good well, friends thank you. <laughs> thank you i appreciate that thank you guys all thank you so much and bye alana Mwah. be good